All right, it is about five o'clock right now, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our program, Understanding Clinical Trials. Uh, my name is Lyle Evangelista, and I am the Patient and Community Outreach Manager for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society here in the greater Los Angeles region. So this program is part of the Closer to a Cure Community Lecture Series, brought to you in partnership between UCLA Health and the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Uh, before we get started on this program, I wanted to go over some housekeeping. Uh, so first, I wanted to make sure to highlight the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions for our speakers, um, click on the chat icon, type your question and send it over, and um, I will be reading them out loud during the Q&A at the end of the program. In the event that you have a technical question as well or need assistance, you'll be able to communicate through the chat as well. So uh, we are recording the program today for your reference and to help others in the future. So to ensure we respect individual privacy, we will be only recording the presenters and their slides and we will have all participants muted during the program. Okay. So very quickly, I did want to talk about the Leukemia, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So um, we are a nonprofit organization focused on finding cures for blood cancer, but also providing support for patients, survivors, and family members uh, throughout the cancer journey. Our information specialists are, um, let me make sure I'm moving this forward. Our information specialists are, um, uh, are available, uh, their master's level oncology social workers, nurses, um, and health educators who can easily be reached through our 800 number online. They're available 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday Pacific time. Uh, so some of the things that they can help you access are um, personalized one-on-one -on -one navigational support, uh, regarding disease and treatment information, but they can also help with uh, nutrition consultation as well as clinical trial navigation, which we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Uh, we also have peer support available, and this can be uh, connecting to somebody one on one um, who has maybe the same diagnosis that you do or treatment um, and get their unique perspective through our first connection program or through support groups in the area. Right now they're happening online, so you'll still be able to access that. Uh, we also do have online chats and LLS community if you want to be able to connect with people over the, you know, online, but also a little bit more anonymous um, that is available to you as well. We do have financial assistance like our copay assistance program, as well as our urgent need program as, and a ton of educational materials. So. Things can be shipped directly to your homes if you're looking for booklets and pamphlets. Uh, we have podcasts, webinars, um, and we have local educational programs. Uh, the one that's coming up for everybody that is local is our 2021 Southern California Blood Cancer Conference. Um, this is going to be on Saturday, March 6th. Uh, we have oncology, hematology experts who, will, who specialize in blood cancer. Um, and they will be speaking about all of the different, on all of the different blood cancers. Um, Dr. Schiller is actually going to be speaking on acute myeloid leukemia, but we have everything from, from, from that specific disease to chronic lymphocytic leukemia to lymphoma, all the way down to myeloma, myeloproliferative neoplasm. So we got the bases covered, um, and it is going to focus much more on adult blood cancers. Uh, we also have sessions including um, the impact of cancer on the family and providing support for caregivers, as well as advocating for more than science, humanizing cancer care. So um, a lot of different topics. I hope you'll be able to join um, and the online registration is on the slide, but I can also send that to you afterwards. Um, also, if you are looking to get involved, um, I'm sorry, this slide is a little bit cut off. But if you're looking to get involved with the organization, we have numerous fundraising um, campaign opportunities and volunteer opportunities uh, to where you can mobilize the mission. Uh, so for example, um, this is supposed to be the power of your story. I know it's cut off, but 
sharing your story can be really powerful. Um, as an honored hero, you'd be able to mobilize, inspire, and educate others with your cancer journey and help bring awareness to the much needed uh, research in cancer. As an advocate, you can also tell your story and talk to policymakers and really change policy um, and impact healthcare and, and really amplify the voices of families who are affected by cancer. Uh, and you can also share your story to help support families on a much more one-on-one -on -one basis, um, speaking to them, um, as I mentioned before, as a First Connection volunteer or just as a patient and community outreach volunteer. So if you're interested, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and that's it for my side of the uh, presentation. So right now, um, without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to our main speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce from UCLA Health, Dr. Gary Schiller. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you. I'm really happy to do that about it topic that uh, I think is really important and one that I've devoted the last 30 years to and we'll see if I can communicate it well that'll be the challenge. So I'm the chief of the hematologic malignancy stem cell transplant program at UCLA and besides that administrative title I put together a clinical research program area in the diseases that are exactly represented by the you know, Lymphoma Society and uh, we uh, to our little program area generally have about 60 patients a year on clinical trials and we often have between 25 and 30 clinical trials at any one time in leukemias, myeloma, MDS, and myeloproliferative diseases. So a clinical trial is a carefully controlled research study um, that has to be conducted at least in this country by doctors uh, and the purpose is really to improve the care and treatment of people with a variety of diseases. Clinical trials, at least in the way that they are done today, they are critical in advancing cancer therapy. Um, many clinical trials in the United States are cancer clinical trials. We used to say that uh, if you uh, compare the clinical trials done, for example, at UCLA in the Division of Hematology Oncology, they probably exceed all the other clinical trials done by every other discipline, surgery, cardiology, rheumatology, gastroenterology, we have probably more trials than all of those others put together. And that's because there is a, already a 70 year history of doing clinical trials carefully conducted, carefully controlled with attention to uh, safety for research subjects. Uh, and um, in the United States, half of the trials that are done are done for cancer. And yet despite this, only about 5% of adult patients participate in clinical trials. Children with cancer are much more likely to participate in clinical trials, which is something we might talk about, but these are just the raw statistics. Some of our clinical trials close early due to insufficient enrollment, which is really a shame. Now that could mean that we did a bad job putting together the trial, or for whatever reason, we weren't able to accrue patients to the trial. Part of this is that a minority of cancer patients are eligible for available clinical trials due to restrictive eligibility criteria. So the clinical landscape is complicated. It's very difficult to navigate. Uh, it's very challenging to uh, figure out how to get on a clinical trial. In cancer, it's easier than most diseases because there's a national website. Now, why do patients enter trials? This is based on a retrospective analysis of patients in a relatively small sample size. 2,000 to me is relatively small for this kind of survey. Uh, but most of them want to advance science. But to be fair, they also want to treat their disease. They also want to obtain better treatment. And although patients who enter clinical trial live longer usually than patients who don't, it is sometimes a misconception to believe that when you go on a trial, you're going to be more likely to survive you as an individual patient as opposed to the aggregate. Uh, fortunately, many of the other reasons are less common, like getting paid for it. We don't pay our patients to go on trials or obtain free uh, medication uh, or, for example, that the primary care provider recommended the study. Most, I think, are a combination of altruism and hope that the clinical trial will make some difference. Now, there are several types of clinical trials. I think this is a little bit 
uh, simplified on this slide, interventional trials which are designed to test the safety and or efficacy of new drugs or treatments, and non-interventional, which is very important, these are trials that collect information, for example, the biology of a disease or behavioral aspects related to disease or to create a tissue bank that will be later used uh, for analysis of certain mutations or certain molecular events that are associated with disease. This is the nitty gritty here of clinical trials as they are conducted today and as they have been conducted since the 1960s. Phase one clinical trials are trials that are safety studies, and they usually are conducted with a novel agent or some intervention across a very broad range of doses. Phase two trials, once a safety dose is established, are conducted to look at efficacy. And phase three trials compare this novel agent at its ideal dose, or what we believe to be its ideal dose, compared to an alternative, a standard, for example, or maybe no therapy at all. And really the gold standard for approving a drug is a phase three trial. But the FDA has been known to approve drugs on the basis of phase two trials if there is no standard. There are also studies that allow for expanded access. So this is typically a drug or intervention or a transplant protocol that has already finished its phase three trial, but the data have not been completely analyzed yet and allow patients access to the experimental program before the results are known. Finally, there's also, uh, and we'll, we can talk about this if there's a, a chance for a uh, question and answer, single patient compassionate access to studies that an institution may not have. No institution can run every study. I don't know if we'll get into it, but let me tell you, to put 60 patients on a clinical trial in my program area, I have nine employees to be able to make that happen, and to handle all the regulatory work, budgets, contracts, stuff like that. And we have lawyers on the campus that I don't employ, but that are taking a, a healthy percentage of the uh, clinical trial monies that help us establish the contract. So for each patient, entered onto a trial, it's an expensive deal, and no institution can have every single trial. Furthermore, no institution has every single kind of patient that could fit overlapping trials. So there might be a trial that a patient wants that we don't have, and we can get single patient permission from the Food and Drug Administration and locally to get compassionate access to a drug that shows promise. The issue with that is, once you use that, you can never enter another patient on that trial unless the site becomes a site for investigation. You have to send the patient off to some other institution that has the study. So this is not done as often as you might think, but at least there is a way that the FDA allows us access to a potentially promising drug in a patient who might not have any other recourse to action and might be too far from a site to get on a study. Now here, let's go into a little more detail. Phase one clinical trials are the first trials in humans. They often follow some animal study or basic science study. The primary goal is to evaluate safety. But I bet there are patients on this call or loved ones who have looked at phase one clinical trials thinking that this is gonna save somebody's life. Sometimes they do. But most of the time, they don't because that's not their purpose. Their purpose is first and foremost to show that drug X is safe. And so a small number of patients are entered at any one time to see whether their side effects are different doses. And cohorts of patients are progressively accrued. Uh, you're somebody's trying to reach me. I can't mute my phone, but we'll let it go to voicemail. Uh, small cohorts of patients are accrued at different doses until you start seeing toxicity. And that will be the maximum tolerated dose. A lot of people ask me, well, why wouldn't you know that right away from the animal studies? And the answer, of course, is obvious because animals have different pharmacokinetics. They handle drugs differently. Look, even within human populations, there are differences in how we handle drugs. And nowadays, almost every phase one trial 
also takes a look at the way drugs are disposed of, how they're cleared in different patients, in different populations, in different genders, in different ethnic groups, and at different ages. Those are very, very important parts of phase one clinical trials. But once you've completed a phase one trial, and if you have some, some inkling, some echoes out there that this drug might be effective at a tolerable dose, then you enter a phase two clinical trial. And that is using the dose that was established as safe, but not too high, based on the, uh, the phase one trial, the drug is tested without a placebo, without a control arm, it's tested in a given disease. And so typically this phase two trial is not one in which the novel agent, the novel therapy, the novel drug or transplant or whatever is not being compared. It's just being run straight and every patient on the trial gets the drug. As you can imagine, I, as an investigator, like phase two clinical trials because there's no mystery as to whether the patient's getting it and you can get very excited. The problem is that sometimes you get really excited about response and we delude ourselves because the kind of patient that could get the trial might have been a very special kind of patient indeed. And when you really look in real world, ex world experience, you may not see it. That's why we do phase three clinical trials. Phase three clinical trials are where two treatment options are being compared typically. The goal is to test a new therapy, new drug, new transplant, some new intervention compared to standard of care. Now, a lot of people have a misconception about this. The, they think that the comparison arm must always be a placebo. But let me reassure you, many times the comparison arm is not a placebo. Patients either get novel therapy X or they get standard therapy Y that has been in use for a long time and is considered typical in the United States, Europe, or both. These trials typically are randomized. A computer randomly selects one or the other. I always joke with my patients that Americans hate this because Americans think they don't need a phase three trial. They, they know what the better treatment is. But you know, I say it as a joke because you know as well as I do, we don't. We don't know what the better treatment is. We need somebody to prove it. Now, um, many of these trials, in order to improve uh, patient interest, will allow for a crossover. So if the patient is assigned the standard, which I might not know and the patient may not know, the patient's disease progresses, he or she can be switched to the novel therapy. That always uh, makes the trial more attractive again, to American patients who think they know the answer. The other is um, all of these trials have what is called a data, data safety monitoring board. This is a group of typically physicians and statisticians who do not have a vested interest in the trial. They don't work for the drug company. They don't work for me. Um, they are people who know the disease typically, but they are not conducting the trial and they analyze the data periodically. And that ha has been instituted by the FDA for good reason. So that if a, a treatment, for example, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine looks much better than the standard, which is nothing, um, you don't put too many patients on the study uh, in order to find that out. You try to glean that statistical information early. Actually, the COVID-19 vaccine may not be a good example. Uh, Scott Gottlieb, the former uh, chief of the FDA, just wrote an editorial, I think today or yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, that maybe there might have been better ways to identify the activity of the vaccines before tens of thousands of people went on the vaccine through a more robust data safety monitoring board. I don't know, that's a subject for another day. Um, the Data Safety Monitoring Board also checks if there is untoward toxicity more in one arm than the other. It could be that the novel therapy is great, but there is a lot of life-threatening liver toxicity. And they will halt a trial before you can ever show statistical benefit 
if they see something that doesn't look good or something new in terms of toxicity. This type of trial is a gold standard and generally a positive study will lead to market approval by the FDA. But the FDA will not only wanna see efficacy, they'll wanna be sure that the new therapy has no safety signals that weren't anticipated and no safety signals that might be so dramatic when compared to a standard of care. Now, expanded access programs do not exist for every single uh, drug or therapy, but they exist for some. So sometimes you have a promising drug that we expect on the basis of phase three trial will be approved, but all the data haven't been accumulated yet, haven't been thoroughly analyzed. So this expanded access is provided by the sponsor, by the company, they, they really do this out of the goodness of their heart, um, to allow access to the trial without being on the randomized trial. For them, what do they get out of it? What they get out of it is that they get um, more safety data. So patients on the expanded access will definitely be getting the experimental drug or the experimental therapy. And this is an opportunity to look for more safety signal because when they go to the FDA, more data to present, uh, and the FDA always likes it if, if they can approve a drug where there's a big portfolio of safety data. Likewise, there are single patient investigational new drug permissions that you can use to get compassionate access to a drug, but a center can only do this for one patient and you need approval from both the pharmaceutical company or sponsor, and you need approval from the university, let's say, or the, um, the institutional review board that determines patient safety. And so it is a bit of a production. And uh, of course, this is done by a program like UCLA for free. We don't get paid for this. Uh, and our staff still have to turn in data and report to the sponsor but we do it as a, a matter of goodwill to give people access. Now, here's an example. So we have an older person, an older lady with the history of AML diagnosed in 2015, and she also had what's called a pericardial effusion, fluid around the heart due to leukemia. At the time, the standard therapy was what's called a hypomethylating agent. It's not a chemo. People, patients call it chemo, but it's not a chemo. Um, and her disease was not responsive. The disease turned out to have a mutation that we analyze in the glucose metabolism pathway. And so she was enrolled on a phase one dose finding safety trial with a drug that targets the mutated enzyme. And lo and behold, even though she was on the phase one trial, which was designed to demonstrate safety, she had a response. And she continues on this drug ever since. I have a feeling this is my patient because I have somebody like this. Um, and subsequently, this drug went through phase two trials and even further into phase three trials and was approved by the FDA. But she got access to the drug in an investigational trial for safety and she had a favorable response and continues on the drug forever. Now, what are the risks and benefits? Because I don't want to sugarcoat this at all. The benefits I think we went through uh, entering a clinical trial, of course, might contribute to the patient's health, but really is for future. It allows early access to new therapies. The drug, of course, is studied for free. Uh, every study uh, seems to demonstrate that in the aggregate, people who go on clinical trials have better outcomes. And it might be because they go to centers where there is kind of an exclusive experience with a single type of cancer. You wouldn't want to go to me to tell you how to treat breast cancer. I, I would admit my incompetence and I wouldn't want to treat you. Uh, I would refer you to somebody. On the other hand, most types of leukemia I have seen, by the way, I still ask my colleagues for help sometimes, uh, just this week, but uh, I will have seen them and I know them pretty well and you get close monitoring, more importantly, from my nursing staff. But what are the risks? Well, the risks should be obvious too. You might enter a trial and the treatment doesn't work. There may be adverse effects that we never anticipated in uh, animal studies or with other people. 
randomized trials, I told you a lot of American patients really detest them because they are afraid that they'll be randomized to the standard of care arm. And if you pull out, not only did you mess up the study, but you might not be allowed on a trial uh, if you're a known candidate that pulls out of studies when you don't get what you want. Also, we have to follow patients carefully for good reason, right? Because we don't know whether this will be safe or effective. And so that means a lot of travel, time away from home or work or family. In the COVID era, we've tried to do some telehealth, but as you could imagine, that is severely limited because we can't do a physical exam on telehealth. So, uh, so telemedicine does not have a good, good track record as far as uh, my research is concerned. I don't like it very much. We do it a little bit. Now, some myths. I can only join a clinical trial if I've exhausted all other options. No, that's not true. Uh, I mean, clinical trials are available throughout the disease process, even, even handling your bone marrow or peripheral blood for storage so that it might be later evaluated when a new gene is discovered. Clinical trials are not safe and I won't benefit from them. Well, this is a very heavily regulated uh, process. Yes, there is a history of clinical trials gone awry, not just in Nazi Germany, but in the United States as well. But that's been a long time. And in the 80 years since, uh, there are a lot of processes that are heavily regulated both by the FDA and by the local site and include individuals who have no vested interest in the trial. You might get a placebo or sugar pill instead of the real drug if you join a clinical trial. Well, we are required to tell you if there is a placebo arm. Uh, most of the time, the randomized trials are against the standard of practice. We certainly would not give a placebo in a serious or life-threatening disease when an alternative is available, but where patients might be randomized and neither you nor the doctor will know, that is very clear in the informed consent. Clinical trials are free. Yes, the drug is always free, but there might be standard therapy like transfusions, let's say, or antibiotics, or if you had some unrelated thing and you had to go to the hospital. Well, that will also have to be covered by insurance, and that's not going to be free, of course, even if we build in a lot of, uh, a lot of payments along the way. How much does it cost to participate in clinical trials? Well, it doesn't cost anything in terms of the drug, the treatment, laboratory tests that are all required by the sponsor. But standard tests just for maintaining your health, those do get billed and they're billed to insurance and they're billed at a rate that is standard care. Many of our clinical trials, because we're in an area where there's a lot of traffic, do involve a travel stipend, parking, sometimes even overnight stay uh, because we have people that come a very long distance. Now, what are the steps in clinical trial? Well, this, is a, this slide is a little out of order. The truth be known, the consent is supposed to be done first. So the first thing we do is we describe the study to the patient. We give the patients an informed consent in their language to understand the risks and benefits of the trial. And when they provide consent, I always tell patients, you're not signing a real estate contract. All you're doing is signing a consent that allows us to screen you for your eligibility. And that's when the inclusion and exclusion criteria are carefully, carefully scrutinized and various testing is done to see if you are the right person for this study the way the study is built. And as you can imagine, if the study is exceedingly restrictive, you're not gonna get patients to go on this study. On the other hand, if this, the study is exceedingly loose, you'll have patients with very, very different biology, different diseases, too many differences to try to make sense of the signal when you make the intervention. And so establishing the criteria and seeing how the patient fits, that's a really important deal. And actually in the last step, my nurse practitioner who does a lot of the screening procedures comes to me and we fill out a checklist of every single item uh, to see does the person really fit. And we don't even trust ourselves. Then we send it to the sponsor and we let them take a look and see if the patient really fits. Of course, in all of this, the visit schedule, labs, and other studies dictated by the protocol are made clear to the patient. And once the patient starts, then we adhere to it. So 
this kind of a, a funnel <laughs> that, uh, that depicts in some graphic way uh, patient data. I don't, again, I didn't make the slide. I'm not sure I'd make a patient look like a domino or like a pill, but uh, there are a lot of potential individuals who could enter a clinical trial. And then with assessing their eligibility, we find the trial that is most likely to be suitable and one in which the patient will pass all the screening tests and can enter the trial. Um, there are some potential barriers to enrollment. Uh, some are related to patient. Some health insurance or, or other uh, coverage restricts or constrains access to trial. That's not supposed to be in California. We're not really not supposed to have any restrictions for cancer patients entering clinical trials. Uh, so if somebody tries to restrain or constrain access, we'll go to bat for you. The trial site, however, may be too far. You know, some patients, uh, for good reason, are not going to want to travel 250 miles if they have to come once a week, and there may not be something closer to them. I think a lot of people don't know what opportunities there are out there, and that's why there's an opportunity for Leukemia and Lymphoma Society to make trials known, as well as the National Cancer Institute website. Uh, there can be fear uh, about loss of control and treatment decision making, but again, as I say, the consent is not a binding contract. The you know, patient always has the right to pull out or to do something different. Still, the complexity of the access and maybe the stringency of trial participation, frequency of follow up, and so on might logistically be a barrier. There are a lot of physician barriers I notice because. I noticed that a lot of my colleagues outside of academic institutions don't have too many clinical trials. And maybe the first to operate in some places, but I think most of the time, the reason people, reason doctors don't offer clinical trials to patients is they may just not have time to run a clinical trial. They may not have the infrastructure, the research structure within the institution that they are at. They're concerned about transferring a patient to another center for fear of losing the patient. We try not to make that happen. Um, there may be uh, some challenges in terms of trial availability at a given site, as I suggested. So um, the current topics in 2020 and 2021 that are, and this is just a, a tiny fraction of them, uh, that have been hot on our, uh, on our list of, of problems, of concerns on the front burner were number one, the impact of COVID-19 on clinical trials. Not that we've had a number, not that we've had a lot of patients get COVID-19. As a matter of fact, on my clinical trial group of those 60 patients I entered in 2019, maybe I can think of one who got COVID-19 and it wasn't from coming to us. It was from the usual Thanksgiving dinner with too many people. Um, but the problem has been that we've had to adapt and patients don't wanna come as often. We've had to use telemedicine, telehealth, and some of the sponsors um, and, um, and cooperative groups don't really wanna run a trial if patients can't be seen frequently. So we've had this stress and strain for a whole year. Should we close a trial? Should we not close a trial? Some of the LLS studies were closed, thinking that, oh, this will only be for three months and then we could get back to normal. Well, here we are a year and we're not back to normal, so they had to open back up. There's another front burner issue that's not just in 2020-21, but been going on a long time, the importance of diversity. We talked about how different people handle drugs differently, how they metabolize drugs differently, how they respond to treatment differently. You will never know that unless you have a diverse population, age, ethnicity, gender. And unfortunately, that is not the case in the United States. Uh, we don't know why. We're not sure that it is only related to access. I think that there are some historical issues uh, that come to play and social issues that come to play. But the real negative is obvious, I think, to everybody on this phone call that if you have a homogeneous patient population and you get drug X approved, you're not gonna use drug X in that homogeneous population. You're gonna be using it in a population that reflects the diversity of people in your 
area. And you may be surprised to find adverse effects that you never thought about. And so it's really, really important that one cannot make a bigger announcement for this to try to make heterogeneous as possible and reach out to the community to have a diverse patient population so that we don't get any surprises and we get a realistic assessment of what a drug or treatment, transplant, CAR T cells look like. So how do you get involved? Well, of course, be proactive, ask your doctor, look at academic websites. Here's ours, for example. The LLS has a clinical trial support center and the National Cancer Institute has a wonderful site that I go to myself, by the way, when I'm looking, called clinicaltrials.gov. All clinical trials have to be listed there and their sites and whether they're accepting new patients for study. And then you go back to your doctor and ask, is this right for me? Um, and of course, the reason for doing all of this is to try to move the ball down the court, not only be innovative, not only provide hope, but really provide efficacy. I think it's good to hope, but it's more important to have results, and that's what we're trying to achieve. So now let me stop sharing. And I said enough controversial things. I bet you there's some questions. Um, we're going to hope, thank you so much, Dr. Schiller. Um, it's all really informative, and I think it's such an important topic to, to discuss and for everybody in the cancer community to really understand. Um, at the moment, um, we are going to hold off on questions um, because um, obviously uh, we talked about the website that UCLA Health has on clinical trials that are available at the hospital, but we also, LLS has a clinical trial support center. Um, and so we wanted to talk a little bit more about this particular service. And so with us today, we have Melissa Kumlosi, who is a clinical trial nurse navigator at the center. Um, and so Melissa, can you go ahead and give us a little bit more information about the program itself? Thank you so much. Can everybody see my screen okay? Good. Okay, and thank you for the introduction. So my name is Melissa Kamlosi, and I am one of the Clinical Trial Support Center nurses. I'm actually a um, pediatric nurse practitioner, and um, I'm just going to briefly go over our um, process for supporting patients at LLS um, with our Clinical Trial Support Center from learning about the patient and their treatment goals, um, also identifying those potential treatment trials for them, and then enrolling patients in trials. So we are committed to providing patient for access for these trials, and we do that by a comprehensive patient navigation system. And we have highly trained nurse navigators to complete nursing and psychosocial and educational assessments when we receive referral forms. And we provide patients with individualized lists of appropriate clinical trials to discuss with their healthcare team. What we wanna do is provide more of a patient-friendly list. And, and we may have a patient that we get that we could identify potentially 100 trials, but we want to narrow that down to a manageable trial list for them that they may be able to talk with their healthcare provider about. We also can speak to different sites and healthcare providers and address the various barriers and provide follow-up throughout the process. We have a lot of um, different touch points with the patient, um, with the trial site as well, and provide that personal connection. So the goal of the CTSC is not to enroll every patient into the trial, but rather increase the opportunities for participation by facilitating that informed decision making and minimizing the barriers for the patient. So we work in collaboration with the healthcare providers team um, to decide if a clinical trial is right for them. And ultimately we are there to educate, support, and empower patients to be active participates, participants in and have control over their treatment decisions. So I did wanna talk a little bit about the outcomes for our fiscal year 2020. We had seven CTSC nurse navigators and we assisted about 779 patients. And through that, we had 9,500 interactions with the patients and caregivers and medical professionals. Um, what is really significant is that we found that we had about 21% of those patients that enrolled in a clinical trial. And, and just to kind of briefly talk about um, what Dr. Schiller was mentioning was that there's usually anywhere from five to 10% of adult cancer patients which enroll in, in nationwide um, or nationwide uh, trials annually, so that's a significant difference. Um, and reasons why patients did not enroll is could be because of restricted inclusion and exclusion criteria, 
It could be because of insurance restrictions, their status, their health status um, rapidly deteriorated. Um, we have had patients refer to us when they've been in hospice or you know, they, things could have changed from the time that we had sent them the trial search. Um, they may be unwilling or unable to travel or also they could have gone into standard care or off-label use. So we did collaborate with the American Society of Hematology, and it's a three-year collaboration, which we launched in January of 2020, and that was just aimed at improving blood cancer patients' access to clinical trials. So our CTSC nurse navigators assisted the patients directly while also working with their healthcare team. And we developed a clinical trial navigation hub, which sits over clinicaltrials.gov. And it's just how it's, it's designed to streamline the trial search process and generate a user-friendly list for the patients for trials. And also we provide educational resources that the patients and caregivers can share with their health team to make an informed decision about their treatment. Um, we also did um, an evaluation, and um, this was by RTI International, and it was a respective um, online survey of 474 patients and caregivers who utilized our services from May 2018 until April of 2019, and this was conducted using a standardized tool. And 142, um, which was about 30% of a response rate, had either partially or fully completed the surveys. And these were just a few questions that we highlighted here, um, just to tell you a little bit about the survey. But the results were that about 99% of people um, that had the conversation with their nurse navigator thought that it was helpful. 92% thought that the nurse navigator was helpful in providing information about what was involved with a clinical trial. 98% um, had the, um, the nurse navigator's ability to answer the questions was very great or excellent. And then 83% said the list of the trials that we provided was easy to understand. This is just um, our, our team here. We have our director, the nurses within our team, and then we also have a coordinator. And to share you something that's uh, share with you something that's very important. This was an example um, of a patient that we had. Um, this was Danny's story. So in 2015, Danny was diagnosed with large B-cell lymphoma. He did have initial chemotherapy and he achieved remission. But then um, in 2017, he had changed insurance plans and he thought, you know, his, his disease would never return. Um, and fast forward to 2020, and he had a relapse of his lymphoma. And to make matters worse, the new insurance plan did not cover any pre-existing conditions. So his oncologist had talked to him and said that he would not live without treatment, but he also wouldn't qualify for a treatment without insurance coverage. So Danny had a friend who referred him to our IRC department who then um, referred him again to then the RCTSC where he met one of our nurse navigators. Um, so because he didn't have insurance coverage, um, our nurse navigator was able to identify a potential trial at the NIH and Laura, which was the nurse navigator, quickly connected him with the oncologist and the PI at NIH, and he ended up enrolling in the trial. So on December 24th, Danny had actually completed his treatments and is currently enjoying remission, living with his family in Texas, and he credits um, you know, meeting Laura and the care team at NIH for giving him access to the treatment that he needed for saving his life. Um, so just to let you guys know, these are a few ways that people can access our clinical trial um, support center. So that's either by calling the IRC or patients and caregivers can actually complete an online referral form. And I did talk a little, about, a little bit about the American Society of Hematology, which the ASH physicians can actually access the, this um, referral form in their portal and other access um, for healthcare providers, and they can complete that referral form online as well. And thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Melissa, for, for taking the time to, to share with all of us a little bit more about the Clinical Trial Support Center. Um, okay, so at this time, we're gonna do our questions and answers section of the program. Uh, there are quite a few questions that have come in, both in the pre-registration and in the chat. So I'm gonna try my best to get through it. Um, so first question, um, is there a cutoff age for most clinical trials? Say that a little louder for me. Is there a cutoff age for most clinical trials? No. There are, however, age uh, specifications depending on the trial. Look, there are some trials that only want patients over 65, believe it or not. There have been a number of drugs in the leukemia business approved that way. 
And then there are trials that don't want anybody of a certain age group. Um, we always advocate to try to dip down into adolescent, adolescent young adults, because the pediatric folks say that they're excluded from typical pediatric trials. So age is a criterion for many studies, and you can imagine why. They, age often predicts for a different version of a disease. AML is not the same in a 20-year-old as in an 80-year-old. They're biologically different diseases completely. So the age is a surrogate for biology. And the other thing I would think is that the way that drugs are metabolized and treatments are tolerated are different. So they are, there are these somewhat arbitrary, but not entirely arbitrary criteria. Uh, and it is true if a study says uh, you must be 65 and above to participate, if you are 64 in nine months, you will not be entered on the trial for sure. No flexibility because statisticians don't allow flexibility. And they're probably right in a way, because where would you draw the line? Gotcha. Um, okay, we did have a couple of questions regarding the COVID vaccine and blood cancer. So one, um, is it true that no clinical trials for the COVID vaccine were done with those with blood cancer? And if that's true, then will there be one? I, I don't know much more than you do. Um, I participated in a few trials that I brought to infectious disease folks from drugs that we've used in uh, hematologic malignancy and transplant, but I wasn't involved in any of the vaccine trials, so I know what you know from the press. And it is to my knowledge that, and publications, by the way, because there have been some publications in the New England Journal of Medicine, for one, um, that immunocompromised people were not included. So Got that's it. a problem, obviously. Does that mean I don't recommend the vaccine? No, of course not. I recommend the vaccine for everybody and took it myself, but, uh, but we really can't tell you efficacy. Gotcha. Okay, um, one question that came in. Um, so should CLL patients treated with venetoclax get COVID-19 vaccine? If so, which vaccine? But I guess we can generalize that um, as an individual with cancer treatment, how do we know which vaccine should be taken? Well, if a trial is ever done, we will get the answer. But I have a feeling what's going to happen is you're going to see a bunch of uh, somewhat anecdotal, almost like phase two trials. Uh, we don't feel that we have the, um, the guts, the rights, the privilege to not vaccinate. Now, the problem is it may not work. I bet a lot of people who ask this question ask it because they're concerned they may have toxic side effects. That's not my thinking at all. My thinking is, will it work? Does a person have an ability on venetoclax or with CLL to mount an immune response? And I don't think you're going to know, but I don't know that you want to be the person who waits until we get a group of 100 patients with CLL who got vaccinated and by the way, what is the end point? Do you want to find out did the, how many of those 100 people got COVID? Or do you want to see if they mounted an antibody response or if they had a T cell response? I mean, you guys be the clinical trialists. Tell me how you want to measure efficacy. We're giving it to people even before trans, allo transplant or auto transplant and after allo or autologous transplant because we don't think that with this kind of horrendous pandemic, we can afford not to vaccinate, but I don't know if it'll work. By the way, I have a little example. The Shingrex, we had no idea whether Shingrex prevented shingles in patients who were immunocompromised. That wasn't how it was approved. However, we now have several years of experience. We give it to our immunocompromised patients and there does appear to be protection, but that's not a rigorous controlled trial. That's clinical experience. Gotcha. Okay. Um, going to the next question, I think going, uh, looking at the diversity question that we were discussing before, do you offer education or curriculum to uh, providers or staff about the need for enrolling minority populations into um, clinical trials and barriers to enrolling um, these underrepresented communities in trial? Well, well, I don't have to because people like you and the American Society of Hematology are doing it quite frequently and quite effectively. So I think that we are 
are quite aware and I think we probably need people with, with boots on the ground in diverse communities to talk in a, not in a lecture like I just gave, but kind of in a more open um, forum where you talk about research abuses in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 60s. And you talk, how does that affect ex access now or interest in clinical trials? And how could one address that? I think uh, that kind of interaction would be very helpful. And maybe you can even do it in some sort of online program that you could make available. But we really look to the big societies to do that because I don't think our outreach is enough. We, we wouldn't have enough patients. Gotcha. So I think there was that, that follow-up question if there was um, impact of minority or pools, um, but because there isn't one, um, I guess that question doesn't make sense. Okay, so I, I will move on to the next question. Um, is there a difference in clinical trials for someone who has uh, multiple myeloma with kidney involvement? So I guess if there's other issues. Oh, that's a good question. Health issues, Ooh, that's a yeah. Good question. Um, does it um, make a difference yeah, for a patient? You know, I'm always, I'm a bit of a fly in the ointment with that too, as you can imagine, because now everybody on this phone call already got to know me. Um, I also um, bring this up as an individual investigator when we have investigator meetings. But if you make a trial so restrictive that, for example, you don't allow patients with renal failure who have myeloma to get on study because you're worried that they'll have too many adverse effects because they can't metabolize the drug. Well, then the next problem will be when the drug gets approved, people will start using it anyhow in patients with kidney disease, and you might see all kinds of unexpected untoward toxicity. So I, I bring this up many, many times. And, you know, the minority of times, once in a while, uh, the company will back down and they'll, they'll change the criteria or they will have a companion study. So for example, that happened with lenalidomide. So we didn't know how to use lenalidomide in patients with renal disease who had myeloma. So they had to do a companion study to look at safety, really safety more than efficacy in patients with varying degrees of renal failure uh, who were getting lenalidomide for myeloma. And they did do that study. That's really good to know. Awesome. Okay. So you got you got to yeah. As an investigator, you got to sometimes uh, show up, go to meetings. They're never fun. Uh, I was joking with some students today. The classic investigator meeting is in the basement of a hotel in a beautiful place, but you cannot go outside until you figured out how to run the study. So they flew us once all to Paris, France. We stayed at the Hilton near the Eiffel Tower. My wife was going around and seeing beautiful Paris. We were in a windowless basement. However many hours it took on a Saturday until we could iron out some protocol. And, uh, and believe me, sometimes it takes many, many, many hours uh, of compromise and argument and things just like your audience has brought up here. Gotcha. But I, I think it's really good to know just because, I, you know, uh, other conditions, I think, are it is becoming more of a norm. I think that we, you, you don't have like a completely healthy person without other conditions um, oftentimes. And so that's what makes, okay. you know, human trials both interesting and complicated. But yeah. you also have a lot of uh, genetic variability. You don't have that on a mouse, of course. And so you need to at least be aware of that uh, when you structure the trial. And it's not going to be perfect uh, because mm -hmm. only in the lab is it going to be perfect. But here we're talking about real life. And so there, it's going to be subject to some interpretation. Gotcha. Um, the next question. So I know you talked a little bit about compassionate use, um, but uh, this question asks, um, can you comment on compassionate use in instances where a patient would otherwise not meet inclusion criteria? Suppose they've had several treatments, 
because uh, of exclusion and are running out of options, is, is there a strategy? Is it a strategy? Tough, tough question. Uh, depends on the sponsor, depends on the drug, depends on how close the drug is approval, if they will waive the inclusion criteria. But many times they don't. You still have to meet the inclusion criteria. Uh, it's just that I don't have the study, but I have this one patient who really wants this study, and I can't get the study that fast. I can get the patient on treatment. So I think it, it depends. It's variable. But most of the time, the inclusion criteria will be the same. The compassionate use is because there's, this trial is not available anywhere near them. Gotcha. Okay, the next question. If you suspect the drug is not working for a particular individual. Yeah, I saw that question. That was a good do question. Do you discontinue you stop the it. trial? Yeah, I, I mean, there is always an out clause. Again, it's not a real estate contract. Um, the patient can stop the study for whatever reason. The doctor can stop the study. It's just called physician discretion. My poor data managers have to input this in a computer. You know, why did the patient go off study? And, you know, they may not even have the criteria, toxicity, lack of response, whatever. Uh, but, you know, sometimes there's other, and the other is physician discre discretion or the patient decided not to go. We have patients sometimes that have a phenomenal response to a drug. A famous one, Selinexor in multiple myeloma, which got FDA approved. It's an amazing oral drug. It has two major toxicities. Nausea, well, that's common with many drugs, but very, very severe fatigue, which is not present with most other drugs. It probably is in the brain. It affects some um, uh, wakefulness center. And we had patients that would go off because of profound fatigue. So that, you know, they're allowed to do that. And then that has to be reported to the FDA. And the FDA has to think about whether that fatigue signal warrants not letting the drug go forward or because of its amazing efficacy, letting it go forward, but putting a warning there that this drug can produce profound fatigue. And they chose the latter because yeah. the drug worked where nothing else worked. But there's a warning on the label. Gotcha. All right, the next question. Uh, so the, the exact question is, is there any info on drugs like clinical trial drugs like pivonodistat? I don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, but I guess, how can you find out more information about particular clinical trial drugs in general? Well, again, there are some websites like the American Society of Hematology, like Leukemia Lymphoma Society, and clinicaltrials.gov which really you type in the disease, you don't even need any more specificity than the disease, and you will get all the national trials that are out there. Uh, next question, um, is the computer selecting patient selection based on the pharmacological agents research done in their labs prior to the phase two clinical trials? Um, well, computer doesn't do any selection. The selection is done by people. So I don't, you know, I guess you could create a computer that was smart enough to do that. Um, but uh, right now we don't have that artificial intelligence. And so maybe that, maybe that's a weak point, actually. Uh, we have to, we or the patient or both have to know about a clinical trial. And then you go through the screening process to determine eligibility. But the computer cannot extract data and tell us which trial for which patient where. Gotcha. Okay. Um, do you know what percentage of women are participating in clinical trials versus men? No, good question. Obviously, it would be disease-based. You know, in breast cancer, it's going to be 90% are going to be women. Um, so maybe you want something that's a little more neutral, like AML. And in AML, it tends to be male predominant for whatever reason. The disease is a little bit male predominant, not a lot, um, but the clinical trials typically are. And you can get around that sometimes by, on a randomized trial, forcing a certain randomization so that you really need to balance in the arms men and women. And that's, that's stratification is done very often in randomized trials. 
Um, if additional physician visits are required by trial protocol, is, patient is the patient responsible for paying for those visits? Nope, and they are. A lot, I mean, the patient is not responsible and they have uh, extra visits. So it's very typical for clinical trial to include visits that you might not do as standard of care, but those must be paid for by the trial. And so, I mean, let me tell you what this process is. It's very challenging in California, it's very challenging. But for every trial, we have to go through an entire list of labs, visits, biopsies, radiographs, anything that is stipulated by the trial. And then the investigator has to say, well, this one I wouldn't do in standard of care, or this one I would do in standard of care. And then that goes to a, a body that we have at UCLA called coverage analysis, but some form of this exists in every institution uh, that uh, kind of canvases some opinion to see if that's really true. And we have a meeting together, which nowadays is all Zoom, but used to be in person. Got it. All right. I know we're a little bit over, but there's two questions left that I think we can squeeze out. No, they're all good questions. This is a very yes. knowledgeable audience, obviously. Yes, absolutely. So um, does the inclusion criteria change as a, as a study drug moves through the phases of a clinical trial? For example, is the inclusion criteria for criteria more restricted in phase one than in phase two or three? I was, I was afraid you were going to read that because I did see that question come across. <laughs> Usually the phase one trial is more inclusive than the phase two or three. So you can imagine that if you're doing a safety trial and you really don't know where this drug might be useful, you could in theory have a, a phase one trial open to all cancers, let's say. There are not so many of those trials now, but open to many, many, many different kinds of cancers. And while you're exploring the safety signal, you start seeing, well, gee, it looks like patients with uh, mastocytosis, these rare patients, they seem to have a great response, but the patients with uh, breast cancer, there nothing is happening. And so you might uh, structure then the phase two trial narrowed down based on what you saw there in that phase one trial. But you can imagine that might not be accurate, uh, but tends to be the other way that trials become, they're bigger in phase one and tend to narrow down a little bit in phase two or phase three. Okay. Um, and last question, at what stage in a cancer diagnosis treatment should a patient explore clinical trial options? Oh, that's a tough question too. Um, if, if, it could be anywhere in what you guys euphemistically call the cancer journey. That's a, a travel, a trip nobody wants to take, of course, uh, but through the course of the disease. Uh, and I think the place where you would maybe think about it early in the course of disease, if there is uncertainty as to what is the best treatment. So, you know, years ago, uh, prostate cancer treated with radiotherapy versus uh, you know, a prostatectomy, a radical prostatectomy. Um, so even there in an early stage disease, you might have people with different opinions and, and, you know, you really don't know where to go with this thing. And so there you might look for a clinical trial, at least to help the rest of the world try to figure out what is the right way to go uh, when they're not so certain what your right way is to go. Uh, so it could be anywhere in the journey. It could be in highly resistant disease, or it could be in initial. The patient you presented now um, with lymphoma, I mean, that sounded like a patient that was first relapse. So that's relatively early when people conventionally get chemotherapy and autologous stem cell transplant. We don't know what the patient went for, but obviously went for some clinical trial, even in that you know, early, early intermediate stage of the disease management. Yeah. All right. So I think that is all of the questions that we had. I'm sorry if I missed your questions, but I think we got all of them. Thank you so much, Dr. Schiller, for thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you and to meet this very educated, great audience. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think all of your answering all of those questions, all, all the information you provided was so wonderful. And thank you so much, Melissa, for sharing so much about uh, the Clinical Trial Support Center and for staying late while you're in Ohio. 
<laughs> You're very welcome. Much appreciated. Um, so thank you. So that's all the time that we have right now um, on behalf of UCLA Health and the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Thank you for joining us and we hope you will join us next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.